Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present today, Jamie Gangon from the Credit Union of New Jersey. Uh, Jamie is their business development manager and has been doing a lot of their programming um, over the past couple of years. So everybody would like to welcome Jamie um, to the presentation today. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have just a few announcements to go over. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program, um, but you can submit them using the questions box, or you can email me directly, and my email address is on the screen there. Um, you can download a copy of the handout from the handout section of the dashboard that Jamie has so graciously provided for us. Um, it'll open up in a new window and you'll be able to download it. Um, if you are having trouble downloading the handout, um, don't worry, uh, there will be a follow-up email that will include a copy of the handout as well as a link to the recording. So this is being recorded. Um, there is also a survey that will be provided at the end of the webinar as well as in a follow-up email. If we have the time, we always ask please to complete the survey. We always appreciate any and all of your feedback. Um, if you're looking for some more information or more financial resources. Um, the Credit Union of New Jersey has compiled a wonderful list uh, of, of tools available at the, the web address there, and I will send that out to everybody so that you have a live link for that. Um, and before I turn it over to Jamie, um, just a, a quick overview of the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, if you're using a laptop or a desktop, this is what your dashboard should look like. If you're using a mobile device, it's going to look different depending on the device but uh, all of the functions should still be there. Um, at any point today, if you have any problems, you can use this raise hand button here, that will alert me, um, and then I will get in contact with you and hope you'll be able to resolve them. Um, you can find your, your audio settings here, make sure that you're connected to your computer audio, um, and make sure that the, the speakers are the speakers you're using, whether you're using a headset or your built-in speakers, uh, make sure that is selected. Um, as I mentioned before, there is one handout for today in the handout section. And if you have any questions at all, please type them in this questions box here, hit send. Uh, that'll get sent to us and we'll be happy to, to answer them. So that is everything that I have for you. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jamie. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for um, coming on today. As Andrew said, there are some handouts that are attached now as i'm going through i might refer to some of those handouts um, i know you might not have them printed but you might want to print them afterward i don't know andrew if you usually email them out to the attendees as well but there's some checklists and things that you might want to look at or refer to if you are car shopping um, so i just wanted to point that out and i just want to make sure everyone can see the screen yeah, it looks good. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get started. So today we're gonna talk about um, the car buying process. Um, it's not something that we do every day, obviously. And when you go to a dealership, these people are doing this, the salespeople are doing it day in and day out. Um, so they're used to this. They're always strategizing um, and coming up with tactics, you know, to, get a better deal for the dealership, obviously. So it's really good to do your homework and to do um, you know, some preparation before you go out car shopping. I recently purchased a vehicle this year and I tried to use some of these strategies uh, myself. So here's um, the objectives for today. So talking about determining what you can afford, um, dealing with dealerships, buying used vehicles, warranty options, and financial and insurance options. So really before you go to the dealership, you want to determine how much you can afford. So you wanna make sure you know how much you can reasonably afford to spend on a new or a used vehicle. So you wanna check your budget, list your income sources, look at your fixed and variable expenses on a monthly basis, and then from there, kind of determine which monthly payment you can afford. And you always wanna make sure you're leaving room for unexpected. And don't forget about other expenses, you know, gas, maintenance, and repairs that are uh, potentially going to happen on that vehicle. So you'll want to also factor in additional costs 
such as the down payment if you're going to put some cash down on that vehicle. Uh, are you trading your car in? What do you think your trade-in is worth? And how much money you can afford to borrow? So here's a couple things that you can ask yourself. So really, you're gonna wanna take a look at your credit and debt history and ask yourself these questions. Am I paying all my debts on time? Am I living paycheck to paycheck? So am I gonna have that extra cash available to make a car payment? What price is realistic? What can I really afford? And is my credit report clean? So these are just some things to start getting you thinking. Getting pre-approved for the loan before you actually go to the dealership gives you an upper hand during price negotiations, okay? Um, so when you get pre-approved, when you go to the dealership, it's a great strategy because oftentimes when you get pre-approved and you're getting your loan elsewhere, that makes you eligible for some of the rebates on the vehicle. Whereas if you take their financing, if they're offering some sort of low rate, zero percent, oftentimes that waives your right for the rebate. So it's great to go in there um, with that pre-approval available. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is when you get the pre-approval, you might be pre-approved for a certain amount, but that does not necessarily mean that has to be the amount of the loan. Uh, of course, you can always go under with a pre-approval. Make sure you know how much you can borrow though, like the maximum amount and the maximum amount you can really afford with those monthly payments too. You don't wanna go in and get something that is over that and you might not be able to get approved or you might not be able to afford it. So make sure you're kind of weighing your options before you go in there and have that in mind as you're shopping. So there are some different factors um, to consider when you're purchasing a vehicle. In the first year that you earn, own a new vehicle, it may lose up to 20% of its original value. Uh, by the end of the fifth year, the value may fall by an average of 35%. So that pace kind of levels off after the fifth year. So when you're purchasing, especially new, try to keep that car for as long as you can and beyond that to really minimize the financial hit. Um, and oftentimes after that five years, a five-year loan is pretty much an average loan for somebody to take out for a vehicle. So at that point, your car's paid off. And if you keep the car beyond that, you can start putting that car payment money aside um, in preparation to buy a new vehicle or to just save or you know something else. Um, when you buy used, you do get more car for less money even though there might be some increased um, repair and maintenance costs. You could potentially spend less per year than on a new car. Um, you know, this is kind of like a changing situation though. Right now, the used car market is actually booming. It's really hot. I don't know if anyone has heard about the um, chip issues with new vehicles, but the chips that they make, I guess the key fobs with, aren't readily available as they were before. So it's taking a little bit more time with manufacturing cars. So the used car market is hot and actually the prices on used cars are a little higher than they were in the past. So you do have to weigh your options when you are shopping now because of that situation um, happening. So just something to keep in mind. But new cars do appreciate the minute you drive them off the lot. So it is great to consider a certified pre-owned vehicle. Um, it offers a lower cost used car, and then it has that peace of mind with the factory back warranty of either, you know, three months or, or a few years in some cases, depending on um, the make and model of the vehicle. Also, um, keep in mind gas prices. So gas prices um, have actually been going up a bit. So, you know, make sure you're aware of what type of fuel economy that car is going to get. Um, and then regarding safety, look for um, electronic stability control. It prevents the loss of control in a turn. Um, and there's tons of other safety features 
you know, now there's lights built into mirrors so you could see if somebody's next to you when you're going to switch lanes, um, you know, in lane control in some of the new cars. So you're gonna find features um, in some of these vehicles, depending on what you're looking at, that you may not have seen in the past. So when I went to car shopping, I was amazed at the new technology uh, that is out there now. And, um, you know, even the Kias and the Hyundais, they have great features and options in there as well. So we're gonna talk about uh, dealing with dealerships. So how do you get started shopping around online, shopping tips, vehicle checklists, pricing, negotiation, um, best pricing negotiation and negotiation tips. So I'm actually going to move forward past this because this is a little video. Okay, so how do you get started when you know, you're know you going to go car shopping? Um, again, education about the vehicle and the loan are you know great places to get started. So research some vehicles, look at the options, look at the pricing um, and the future functionality of the cars that you're considering. And of course, look into you know your loan and leasing and buying um how you're going to pay for that vehicle shopping around uh visiting different dealerships you know i went into one one day to do a test ride i really wasn't happy with the dealership so i ended up leaving didn't purchase anything a couple weeks later i went to another dealership I liked the salesman and I ended up buying my car. So sometimes it's good to kind of shop around unless you do feel comfortable at that first place you go into. Um, but always look around online. There's all the vehicles listed at that specific dealership so you can kind of get an idea of what they have on the lot and what specific cars you might want to look at. Um, it's also good to make sure the dealership is located close to your home. Um, and to kind of evaluate that service department, sometimes when you're purchasing a vehicle, they include a maintenance plan. So you wanna make sure the service department is reputable and that the dealership is close so you could get it back there so that you can use that maintenance plan. Um, it's always good to ask family or friends too, if you know someone has used that dealership, asking, asking them about their experience and you know seeing what they have to say. If you were car shopping for maybe a teenager, if you're looking around for them, it's always good to bring them along for that experience so they could see what happens at the dealership. Um, and this will provide them a little, you know, experience for the future when they go out car shopping on their own. So any savvy car buyer is really gonna take advantage of the internet and gather information about car pricing. Um, and I'm going to refer to one of the handouts. So handout number one is the auto buying resource handout. And again, you can take a look at that at your own time, but this is something that goes along with that. And there's some information on that handout. So yeah, shopping around online is a great idea. It can, first of all, get you educated on the vehicle, what features are in there, um, what features you really want. So I actually did that too. So I knew pretty much what we wanted in the vehicle before we got to the dealership. <clears throat> Here's some more shopping tips. So once you decide on a particular type and size vehicle, um, of course, looking around online and looking at at least three dealerships or lots um, is you know, something that you should do. See the pricing may differ a little bit between the lots. Maybe there's different rebates that are offered on that specific maker model. The other thing, um, it's good to take someone else with you to the dealership. Even if they don't know much about cars, it's better to kind of have someone there that you can reason with, that you can talk to. Maybe, you know, they notice something that you don't notice on that particular vehicle. So it's always good to have someone else along with you. And then taking records and notes as you're shopping can kind of help you with the process. There is a handout, again, that goes along with this. 
It's um, handout number two, vehicle options to consider. So this provides you a checklist um, and you can go through this and see what options you really want in a vehicle and maybe weigh out which ones you could do without, especially if you're looking for like a specific price point. Um, it's good to decide, do you want electric everything in the car or could you go without that? Do you need the sunroof or could you go without that? So see what matters to you most as you're going through this. So uh, this slide shows you the vehicle checklist and I'll just read it in case anybody um, can't see. So visibility and comfort, radio sound and quality, road feel, noise level, heat and air, and does the vehicle fit your lifestyle? So are you a single person riding around? Do you have a family? Um, you know, are you an older couple that might be going into retirement? So this vehicle needs to fit you and where you're looking to go or move forward. Okay, so now we are going to touch on um, vehicle pricing. I feel like this is always very um, confusing to me because you go to the dealership and there's this sticker on the window and there's the suggested prices. So the MSRP is the vehicle's published retail or base price without options, a destination charge, or other fees. So dealers are free to sell the car at a higher or lower amount of that suggested MSRP. Um, optional equipment refers to features or packages for which you pay extra for, and you can try to negotiate the price of that optional equipment. Destination charge fee covers the cost of delivering the vehicle from the factory to the dealership, and that's typically a non-negotiable item in that window sticker. Um, it's usually the same cost for all models within a brand, and it doesn't depend on the actual shipping distance. So there's also something called a market adjustment, and that's a fee that the dealer tax on, typically to cars that are in high demand. Um, you know, one thing as I was car shopping, I found out I have a relative that works kind of in the auto industry, Jeeps hold their value um, really well. You can actually get a really good trade-in on the cars, but when you're going shopping, this is like a car that it's really hard to negotiate with because people, everybody wants a Jeep, everybody wants to buy one. Um, so I just thought of that because we were talking about high in demand vehicles, but just something I wanna mention, when you are shopping too, like the resale value of that vehicle might matter to you. So if you know it's a car that is going to, you know, depreciate a ton in value, or you know if it's a vehicle that's going to hold the value, um, it kind of, you know, helps when you're purchasing and deciding what you want to do. So um, back to the sticker pricing. The sticker price is the total retail price for the vehicle. So that includes MSRP options, destination charge, and market adjustments. So the dealer typically tries to sell the car for as close to this price as possible um, or offer you the token discount or manufacturer discount. So to get the uh, best price, negotiate up from the dealer's true cost. We're gonna talk about that on the uh, next slide rather than down from the sticker. So the more information you have um, about pricing, the better likelihood that you can get a better deal on a new or used car. So if you go online and do some research, um, Edmunds.com is a website or kellybluebook.com, you can find out the true market value price. And that, kind of, that price reflects what others are play, paying for that car in your geographic area. Um, researching the value of your trade-in online is also a great idea. So um, go and see if you can get a value of the trade. One thing I did when I was car shopping, I actually looked at Carvana and Auto Lenders. Um, they buy your car outright instead of selling it at the dealership. So I kind of talked and went with both of them to get pricing first to see what kind of price I could get for my trade. 
One thing you do um, want to keep in mind is when you trade a car at the dealership, they can actually waive the taxes or they should waive the taxes on the sale of the vehicle, um, uh, the trade of the vehicle. So there should be a little bit of money that actually comes off. So um, keep that in mind too when you are looking at a trade. Typically you can get more money from that trade in if you're selling it outright to someone versus trading it in at the dealership, but just keep the tax um, situation in mind too that you can get money off of the taxes for trading in the vehicle. So there's a couple different ways you could go. Um, I, when I actually traded in, I ultimately went with one of the online vendors. I went with Carvana. They were giving me um, a significant amount more for the trade. So I ended up going that route instead. And they came to the house, inspected the car, picked it up and handed me a check on the spot. So just something to look into if you're trading in a vehicle. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the price negotiation. So obviously, this is not something that we go through um, multiple times in life. Um, you don't go through this process every day. Salespeople are negotiating multiple times a day, um, 100 times per year. So you definitely have to go in there prepared and do your homework to try to negotiate the best price. Um, negotiation skills vary for each buyer, but really the key to success is just gathering as much information as possible before finalizing that deal. Um, ultimately, the car price is going to depend on the options that you're looking for. There's obviously different versions of a vehicle, different models, um, standard options, then there's options you can add on. So if you know what kind of car you're looking for, especially if it's a new car, consider going online and actually building out that vehicle and pricing that out. Um, so you can see what the cost options are when you're doing it online before you get there. Um, and again, remember if you're buying a popular car that is short in supply, you're going to pay more, especially when it's something that first goes on the market. I know the new um, vehicle on the market right now that I keep seeing around is the Ford Bronco. So newly designed car. Um, I haven't seen any at dealerships a couple months ago when I was looking. So I know a lot of people were kind of building them on their own from scratch and doing that order. Next, we're gonna touch on negotiation tips. Um, it's always good to keep negotiation separate Consider questions about financing, service contracts, trade-ins, or extras after you settle on the price of that vehicle. Um, now, I was trying to negotiate with my vehicle, and we were putting some cash down, but we weren't kind of upfront about that at first. And you know, after it was all said and done, they said, "Oh, well, if you were putting some cash down, you should you should have let us know that upfront." So. It's, it's really hard with dealerships and negotiations. Um, you just have to kind of stay tough if you have a price in mind and go in and, you know, work on that salesman to try to get that best price offer. Um, a lot of times they're going back and forth to the finance manager too, asking different prices. So if you're trying to negotiate, make sure too you're in for the long haul and you're, you have some time and you're willing to wait to get the best price possible. So next, we're going to talk about buying used vehicles, um, advice for buying used, a used car inspection list, the FTC used car rule, and buying from a private party. So bottom line is to really find out as much as you can about the history of any used car you're thinking about purchasing. Um, you know, you want to find out if it's been in any accidents, uh, make sure that odometer is accurate. Um, you know, did it ever fail inspection? Just, you know, a couple things as an example. But if you go on Carfax or ask for the Carfax, that is going to give you some information on that vehicle. You could even call the State Department of Transportation 
or check websites to see if there's any vehicle history um, that you can find online too to do a little additional research. The other thing you wanna find out is if the vehicle carries a factory warranty. And if it does, you wanna make sure it's transferred over into your name. So we're gonna to just touch on um, you know, that used car inspection list. You definitely wanna take your time when you're checking the interior and exterior, if it's a used vehicle, you know, looking for any dings, scratches, um, how does the interior look? Was it taken care of? Is it worn? Um, make sure all of the accessories work. Uh, does the car have all the um, equipment? Is there a spare tire in the back where they're supposed to be? So just make sure you're taking notes and keeping good records as you inspect the used vehicle. Um, handout number three, you can use to jot down general impressions of that used vehicle. Um, and if it's something you find useful, you could always make a couple copies if you're looking at a few different cars to make sure you're bringing that along with you and inspecting it properly. I'm gonna to touch on this briefly. Um, so there was a used car enacted to prevent and discourage misrepresentations um, and unfair omissions of material facts by used car dealerships concerning warranty coverage. So um, the buyer's guide provides important information to consumers about used vehicles they're thinking about buying and ensures that buyers get the information in writing about any warranty protection they have if there's a problem with the car. So the buyer's guide must be prominently placed on the vehicle inside of the vehicle and on the outside of the vehicle um, so that the guide is readable. And there's a little sample of what it would look like um, on this slide. Buyer's guides don't have to be posted on motorcycles and most RVs, so just something to keep in mind. Anyone who sells less than six cars a year doesn't have to post a buyer's guide. Um, so if, it, if you're buying off of a person, you see a car, you know, sitting out in somebody's yard for sale, keep that in mind too. But the used car rule applies in all states except for Maine and Wisconsin. So just something to look for um, or something you might notice if you're buying used. <clears throat> so I'm just going to briefly touch on again, buying from a private party. So they generally aren't covered by the used car rule and they don't have to use a buyer's guide. So you, the buyer, you're encouraged to use the guides list of an auto's major systems as a shopping tool. So you can also ask the seller if you can have the vehicle inspected by your mechanic. Um, if somebody refuses, that's obviously a red flag. So private party sales are typically as is mm -hmm. and they're not covered by an implied warranty. Many states don't require individual sellers to ensure their vehicles will pass state inspection. So again, keep that in mind and you can always reach out to the state if you're wondering this and you're buying off of a private party sale. Going to discuss warranty options. So new car warranty, full warranty on used cars, warranty problems and warranty disputes. So a new car warranty is built into the price of the new car. So make sure you're asking questions and understanding what that warranty covers and what it doesn't. Um, you'll also want to have an understanding of how long the warranty is good for. Is it five years or 50,000 miles or whichever comes first? A bumper to bumper warranty may not cover everything. So you might wanna ask for specifics on that. If the warranty is for normal wear, ask what is considered normal, normal wear. Uh, for example, does it cover brake pads? Uh, some new cars have a maintenance agreement. Um, for example, that might cover oil changes um, or routine maintenance. And again, is there a dealer close to where you live that can service that warranty? So typically when you're shopping, you wanna make sure that dealership is you know, within a decent distance so you can get back and forth if, if you do have warranty coverage. So you have the right to see a copy of the dealer's warranty before you buy. Review it carefully, determine what's covered and what's not. 
and make sure you get a copy of the dealer's warranty document if you buy a car that's covered by a warranty. Um, dealers may offer a full or limit wa limited warranty on all or some of the systems or components in a car. Most used car warranties are limited and the coverage varies. Um, in fact, some systems or parts may be covered by a full warranty and others by a limited. An implied warranty is an unspoken, unwritten promise from the seller to the buyer that the car being sold must meet reasonable quality standards. And the most common type of implied warranty is the warranty of merchantability. So the seller promises that the car will do what it's supposed to do, and that applies to the basic functions of the vehicle. But that doesn't necessarily cover everything that could go wrong. Okay, if you have any issues with the warranty, um, you know, obviously first you wanna to try to resolve it with the dealer. Contact a local manufacturer rep if it's under warranty. Um, if there's any problems, you might need to take it to the Better Business Bureau, but hopefully you can get it resolved before it gets to these final steps. Seeking mediation, file a claim, um, or ultimately sue. So some manufacturers such as Chrysler and Ford don't use auto line or auto cap. They've set up their own unbiased panels, um, which are related to any warranty disputes or arbitration. So arbitration on a vehicle is free. You don't need an attorney unless you want one. And there is no fee for filing a complaint. Uh, any arbitration decisions will be given within 40 days. You don't need to attend the meeting in which your case is discussed unless you decide you want to appear, but you do have to submit a written statement, um, which has to include your name, address, description of the vehicle, and VIN, and offer any documentation you believe is necessary to strengthen your case. So the panel's decision is binding on the dealer, but not on you. So you don't have to accept it, and you can pursue further action and bring the matter to court if need be. Arbitration panel members review warranty disputes, uh, not matters involving the sale of vehicles, personal injury, property damage, design of a vehicle, or matters in litigation. Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, financial and insurance. So do you need new car extras? Discussing the service contract, deciphering financing options, Beware of loan markups, upside down loan, um, touching on leasing if it's right for you and leasing tips, and then auto insurance coverages, insuring teens, and how to save on car insurance. So do you really need um, new car extras? So if these items are on the bill of sale, consider putting a line through them, um, fabric protectant, paint protectant, rust proofing, um, just some examples. Um, VIN etching, that's something you could do on your own. Service contracts are usually double the price of the actual cost, so there is a high markup on service contracts. Um, and vehicle bodies, they're typically protected against rust anyway. They're already coated, and really rust is not a major problem with modern cars. Um, you can treat upholstery and apply paint protectant yourself with good off-the-shelf products. So these are some suggestions of things that you can scratch right off the top. So next, service contracts. So it's likely that an extended warranty or service contract will be offered to you when you buy. A service contract is not a warranty. Um, and only the original equipment manufacturer can offer a warranty. A service contract in a, is an extended warranty that always costs extra, and typically that's tacked on the bill of sale. So a service contract backed by an auto manufacturer is usually your safest bet if you choose to get one at all. The contract may cover a wide range of repairs and services, and the, those repairs would have to be done at authorized dealerships. Unless your contract includes a deductible, you won't pay for anything except for those approved repairs. So make sure you are asking questions before buying a service contract, and that's going to continue on the next slide. 
Um, and just keep in mind that the service contract, which is an extended warranty, doesn't cover anything already covered under the factory warranty. So if your service contract is five years, 100,000 miles on a car with a factory warranty of three years, 36, you're really, on, you're really paying for that additional two years and 64,000 miles. So in this case, your true cost for the service contract is much higher. Make sure you know who's going to back the service contract. Um, if, it, if it is the manufacturer, the dealer, or is it an independent company? A service contract from an independent company could cost less than a service contract from a manufacturer. Um, but make sure you know the quality of the contract because that can vary company to company. Okay, um, know how to decipher financing options. So I was touching on this earlier in the presentation. Remember when you get a rebate, you're actually foregoing the low interest rate on the loan. So adding in that rebate can actually make other financing more attractive because you're ultimately financing less money. Um, so don't let 0% financing or employee discounts kind of lull you into not wanting to, you know, negotiate or look for other financing or go prepared. Um, you you want to just be prepared and be able to haggle with that price of the vehicle. So yeah, 0% could offer you some lower monthly payments, but it might work out better in the end if you're getting those rebates. So that's a calculation you kind of have to do on your own too. Um, know that some dealers make up lost profits by pushing extras, um, such as those extended warranties or service contracts. Although um, some automakers offer incentive programs, such as rebates and low-cost financing, better finance options might be available. So just make sure you're, you're looking and you're going prepared. Um, dealer incentives are almost always available on lower selling models with lower resale values. So they can have bigger prepayment penalties and require bigger down payments. So really, you don't want to sacrifice something when you're looking at these cars that one might have a rebate and one doesn't. <clears throat> Beware of auto loan markups. So consumers who finance vehicles through auto dealerships are charged collectively um, at least, you know, millions of dollars annually more in undisclosed finance markup charges. Um, this is a practice that's encouraged by the autos industries with their finance companies and top banks. So sometimes when they're running your credit, depending on what your credit looks like, dealerships are able to mark up that interest rate a little bit to kind of cushion what they're making. So just keep that in mind too. When you go through a credit union or a bank, the rate is the rate. There's no markups involved. Um, there's nothing taxed on. It, it's a clean rate, whatever, based on credit. So um, getting upside down in a loan, that is owing more on your car loan than what your car is worth. So when you're not putting money down, it's not unusual to be upside down in a vehicle because when you drive that car off the lot, it does depreciate in value. So if you find yourself in this position, if you're currently in an auto um, and you are upside down, I always advise people to keep that vehicle as long as they can, um, at least until the loan left on the car matches the car's trade-in value. If you do need to get rid of the vehicle sooner, um, try selling it yourself or consider bundling that negative equity into the new car loan. I don't like to really advise people of that because then you're going to get upside down in that next car too if you're bundling that in. Um, but if possible, um, try to pay a little more on those payments to get your um, self you know, back in a position where you're even with the vehicle and the price of the loan. Um, is leasing right for you? So make sure if you're looking to lease, you understand the difference between leasing and owning. 
with leasing, you're going to have a car payment every month. Um, but when you make that car payment, it's still not actually yours. You're paying to borrow that car. Now, a lot of times they'll offer lease buyouts at the end of the two-year lease or three-year lease, whatever that is. But some people prefer to pay their car and then be payment free uh, versus, you know, paying the vehicle, then kind of deciding or going into another lease because that car is never yours. So monthly lease payments are typically lower than monthly loan payments because you're typically paying for the vehicle's depreciation plus the charge to rent taxes and fees. With leasing, they, you might have some upfront costs, such as the first month's payment, um, a refundable security deposit, and capitalized cost reduction, taxes, registration, and other charges and fees. A typical lease allows you to drive 12,000 to 15 mile, 15,000 miles a year without penalty. Um, and if you do go over that, you're generally charged, you know, per mile. So negotiate the lease price just as you would if you were buying. So don't let in that you're leasing until you have that car price you want. You are responsible for early termination charges if you do end the lease early. And try not to let the lease outlast the vehicle's basic warranty or you could potentially be paying for repairs on that vehicle that you don't own. Uh, it's always good to consider gap coverage. That protects you if the vehicle is lost or stolen. It covers the difference between what you owe and what the car is worth if that is to happen. Next, we're just gonna talk a little bit about auto insurance coverage. Um, several states are, I mean, I know in New Jersey, they require you to have insurance when you have that vehicle and you're asked to provide that insurance um, when you're getting a loan. So liability, that in covers bodily injury, property damage liability, um, if any damage occurs to a person or a property. Uninsured versus underinsured, that protects you and your passengers from financial loss. If an accident is caused by a dryer who does not have sufficient or any insurance coverage. Medical pays medical expenses for injury resulting from an auto accident, regardless of whose fault it is. Auto collision covers your vehicle for damage that results from the accident. Comprehensive coverage covers your vehicle for everything other than collision, such as fire, theft, wind, hail, vandalism. And miscellaneous, some coverages are included in the basic auto policy, such as towing, road service, car rental, um, and so on. Some policies do include towing and road assistance, but others don't. We'll briefly touch on um, insuring teenage drivers. So when purchasing a vehicle for a teenager, safety should be the most important factor to consider. Okay, because teenagers really have the most accidents. Um, teenagers are typically concerned with the appearance of the vehicle, you know, color, price, and safety in the last order, where parents are looking at safety, price, and vehicle condition. Uh, check with your insurance provider about whether it offers teen driver discounts. And even after a child graduates from high school, there may be insurance discounts available when they're in college, depending where that child goes to school. So always ask your insurance agents for information. Um, how to save on auto insurance. I always advise people to shop around every couple of years, whether it's auto insurance or homeowners because the rates vary so widely. Um, sometimes that insurance is going up every six months. So make sure you're shopping around to get the best price possible. Always evaluate the reliability of the insurance company. Um, ask for recommendations if a friend or family member has a company that they're happy with. Um, when you apply for coverage, your application is subject to underwriting review. So they're gonna look at things like how far you drive, job stability, um, ages and driving records of everyone in the household, loss history. They can even review your credit report and credit score. 
And sometimes your credit score will determine whether you're issued a policy and what the premium is. So that's just something to keep in mind too. Um, gap protection, we touched on this a little bit with the lease. That's an additional coverage that you can add and that pays the difference between the amount you owe and what your vehicle is worth if something is to happen to your vehicle if it's totaled. And here is the final checklist. Um, you know, plan to get pre-approved, have a good credit history, know what you can afford, um, know what you need and want, do some research on safety and reliability, know how to find the dealer invoice and other options, um, know what to look for on a test drive and how to negotiate. So that is going to really conclude the webinar for today. I thank everyone for coming and listening. And if there's any questions, I would be happy to help. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jamie. Um, yes, if anybody does have any questions, you can uh, submit them using the, the questions box in the, in the dashboard. So uh, let's see. Um, do you recommend buying a car from an online dealer like Carvana? Um, I think it's a great option. I actually had a friend that did that. She went through auto lenders and did her trade and actually purchased a used vehicle through them. And she had a great experience. Um, they offer decent prices. Uh, I would just say, you know, do some comparisons. If you have a specific vehicle in mind, look at that vehicle and see, you know, look at it at another dealership too. If there's the same, a similar used vehicle, maybe same year, same make and model, same features just to do like a price comparison. But I would definitely look into them for trades as well. If you're looking to trade a vehicle, sometimes they can offer more um, money for you. Uh, somebody, I've been a couple of people asking about the, the handouts. Um, all three handouts are there, they're just in reverse order. So the last page, is handout one, the second to last page is part of handout one, then you can see on the bottom, they're just in reverse order, but all three handouts are there. Okay, um, yeah, I don't I don't know if everyone can still see my screen, I just yes. pulled them off. Yep. Okay, yep, and they're labeled at the bottom. If you look, handout three, handout two, handout one. Um, how do I find what the dealer invoice price is? Will the dealer show me the invoice? That can be done online. I believe the website was admins.com that they suggested using to find that dealer invoice price. I'm just trying to flip back to the slide. Um, but I believe it was admins.com. So that could be, that research should be done online. Yep, that's exactly what it is. How do you handle high pressure sales tactics? <laughs> you know, I, you definitely have to be a strong willed and just don't fold if there's something that you really want or if you're looking for that specific price. Um, I always, I was telling myself when we were going car shopping and like I said, we had went to one dealership and they were just unwilling to work with us at all we were talking about negotiating on the price, negotiating on the trade, and they just weren't willing. So we ended up getting up and walking out. And I think you just have to be prepared to do that if you're not happy and you're not getting anywhere and they're not trying to negotiate at all. So be prepared to get up and walk out and maybe go look at another dealership. So I particularly bought um, a Dodge Durango. So we went, like I said, we went to one different place, but I had two other dealerships kind of in mind in case that scenario happened. So ultimately we went to the one and then the second one we bought at because we liked the salesman, he was willing to work with us um, and it was just a better experience. So be willing to get up and move to it somewhere else unless that's the only vehicle that you want and you're going shopping and, and you kind of don't have a choice. So we were just flexible.
Are there any other questions? Um, nothing yet, but we can wait a few minutes just to see if, if anybody has any. Um, I guess, what do you do now that, you know, cars are, are in demand? <laughs> you know, it can be difficult to find a, a car. You're absolutely right. And it it's definitely a different situation than we've probably experienced in a long time because typically there's a ton of cars on the lot and they're all there. And when I went and purchased my vehicle, it was actually prior to um, all of the chip stuff happening. And it's, it's hard. So um, it's almost like the housing market. It's actually a really horrible time to buy a house or a car at this point, but it's a seller's market. So it's it's a really good opportunity to sell. Um, I think, you know, negotiating is gonna be tough if there's not a lot on the lot, depending on that make and model that you're looking at. So that might really affect what you end up purchasing too, um, you know, if you're able to negotiate price. But definitely, you know, go in with a set price in mind so you know, okay, I can't go over this because then my payment's going to be higher than I want or whatever it may be. Um, that way you kind of stay on target for what you're shopping for. Yeah, somebody has has echoed that, uh, that sentiment saying, um, you know, given the, uh, the current market, dealers are very reluctant to, to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> True. And asking for Absolutely it. true. And again, that even the used car market, it's really hard to negotiate on a used car because they're so popular right now. And and they're getting dealerships are getting a lot more for those used cars than they would have in the past. And you're just it's a really tough time to buy and negotiate. Um, are you seeing the same trends on uh online dealers versus your brick and mortar dealers? Um, I'm going to say yes, just because of the market being the way that it is. But again, you, you could potentially, especially if you're trading, you're going to get more for your trade than you would have a couple of years ago. Um, so that's like another good thing to keep in mind if you're in that position. You might be getting more for the trade, but you're not going to be able to negotiate on that price of the vehicle. So it's kind of, it's really across the board. Uh, somebody commented that they bought a used car, which was leased, and now the car insurance charges more. <laughs> oh, wow. For the auto insurance. Yeah, I mean, even like lease buyouts, I'm actually working with a member to do a lease buyout, and the lease company they're really not helping her because they can make more on that used car than for her to buy out the lease from them. So it's it's definitely like a tough position to be in, but. And just, I would say from my experience, um, we just, we ran through a couple cars in the past uh, two years, but um, the, the price that you negotiate and then you when you have your payments, um, just be aware that that won't include any gap insurance, extended warranty, service contracts, and your price payment could go up significantly depending on the options you choose. And it might be a shock when you get into the finance office and you know this is actually your total price. This is actually your monthly payment. So remember to, to put that in or think about that um, as you're, you're doing your negotiation. Yeah, definitely. It's good advice. Uh, I have heard elsewhere also that you get more for your trade-in, but again, have found that dealers are offering less than Edmund says my car is worth. Yeah, it's it's typical that dealers aren't offering um, good amounts for the trade. That's I was suggesting looking at auto lenders or Carvana. So the other thing too, though, with dealerships and the trade is the taxes. So when you're trading in that vehicle, some of the tax actually comes off of the bill of sale for the next vehicle. So there's a little bit of a calculation and it, 
I can't really explain how to do it, but there's a little bit of extra money that will come off the top of the new car when you're doing that trade. So I think when dealerships are offering you trade money, they're kind of accounting for that money that you're going to um, gain by trading in there. So when I actually though did my trade, I made out better going through Carvana and doing the trade. So they offered me a few thousand more to take the car but I lost out on that tax incentive at the dealership. So you just have to kind of counter which benefit is better for you when you're doing it. So when I did it too, like if you're trying to put that money down, you have to kind of time it too that you're getting the check for the trade and that you have it available to put down on the new vehicle if you do it that way instead of at the dealership. So it's it's definitely good to like explore Carvana and auto lenders and see what they're going to give you. But Carvana did give me offer me more than auto lenders and auto lenders was unwilling to budge. So again, good thing to look at both. Uh, what's the best way to find out taxes purchasing a car from a different state? For example, I'm living in New Jersey and may buy a car uh, from Pennsylvania taxes or extra fees. Um, I don't think it varied at all. I, I actually didn't look at the tax rating um, per state, but I when I went shopping, I actually looked at a dealership um, in PA and New Jersey. Alrighty. Well, it looks like that is all. So I can say we can go ahead and, and wrap it up there. So I'd like to extend my thanks again to Jamie for a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you to the audience for, for joining us today. Um, I will have Jamie's contact information available for everybody so that if you have further questions, um, you can certainly reach out to, to her. So um, be on the lookout for the follow-up email that will include a recap, the recording, as well as the, the handouts. And uh, as I like to close right now, be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon. Thank you.